Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the York Festival of Ideas Online. My name is Lawrence Black. I'm the head of the history department at the University of York and I'm chairing this evening's event. Today's event is part of the York Festival of Ideas Online. Although in a different format, the festival continues to aim to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest caliber of public events. The 2020 festival has over 40 online events offering an inspiring program for all ages. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you enjoy the adventure we are about to take you on. Before we begin, a few technical notes. If you are watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. This is available throughout the talk, so questions can be asked at any time. Should you have technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again. With those notes uh, uh, hopefully clearly communicated to you, we move on to the main event, which is to discuss this book, The Lost Decade, 2010 to 2020, um, written by Polly Toynbee and David Walker. Um, Polly and David, as I'm sure you know, are leading journalists, and their book surveys one of the most tumultuous periods in modern British history, the 10 years from 2010. Um, the Lost Decade looks at how austerity and paralysis nurtured contempt for leaders, institutions and fellow citizens and fertilised the ground for a rebellious Brexit. The disorganisation and confusion around COVID-19 are in large measure the result. They point to a decade characterised by national tragedies from Grenfell to Windrush, food banks and the property crisis and now of course pandemic. But as Adam Smith said, there's a great deal of ruin in a nation. No truthful portrait of an era can be monochrome. They point to bright spots, including the rise of renewable energy, lower crime rates, legalization of same-sex marriage, and the creative industries punching well above their weight, at least until spring 2020. Um, Polly and David have written, uh, I'm gonna count four books previously, Dogma and Disarray, um, unjust Rewards, The Verdict, and Better or Worse, all of them assessing contemporary politics and measuring success and failure. Polly, as you know, is a columnist for The Guardian. David is a former director of public reporting at the Audit Commission. And I'm going to hand over to David and Polly now, who are going to talk to you, and we'll come back. I'll ask a few questions, and we'll turn the debate over to the, to the audience. Polly, David all yours. Thank you very much Lawrence. Um, let's, let's start by saying this, that even if in the years after 2010 we'd lived through years of plenty, there'd been no austerity, no Brexit, Covid would still have struck very hard. Families would still have mourned premature deaths, vital protective equipment would have fallen short and the economy would still have been polarised. But the lost decade made things much worse in care homes, hospitals, and in the morale and capacity of public services. And for leadership, the UK could only turn to a variant on the same Westminster cast, still in power after 10 years, distinguished by dogma, disarray, and disastrous handling of Brexit. The lost years resulted in a COVID death rate uh, far higher than it need have been, and it helps explain why a country that formerly had such formidable apparatus of epidemiological expertise failed to respond adequately on time. Covid expressed, exposed rather, the full extent of errors made after 2010. Social security protection stripped away, the civil service weakened, market competition thrust on the NHS, international cooperation arrogantly rejected. And these weren't accidents. Actions they were claimed at the time as proud achievements by the Cameron Coalition, then by Theresa May and Johnson's brigade of true Brexit believers. We wrote the book just before the pandemic. 
In time, inquiries will be held that aren't stitch ups by ministers and judges will get to opine and reckonings are going to be made. But answers to the long list of COVID questions are really already visible. They begin right here in our account of what happened after 2010. High on the list were the policies of fragmenting and outsourcing in the NHS, breaking up English schooling and deprofessionalising teachers. Local government should have stood as a frontline defence against the virus, but it had been denigrated and dismantled. These were policies not directly applied in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but there too, austerity enforced uh, UK-wide had undermined public services. And you have to, to understand where we are now, we have to look back a few years. I mean, many bristled with indignation at the sight of those, those Tory ministers and MPs who were clapping the NHS every Thursday night. It was a genuine change of heart, might have been forgiven. On his discharge from hospital, Johnson claimed he'd undergone a kind of epiphany over the value of lives saved by hospital nurses. But repentance has to acknowledge the damage that was done by the poly policies that he and all of his companions had all enthusiastically supported uh, as the, they pushed the cuts through. But it was also the 2012 Health and Social Care Act, which, affecting England, bro bro broke up and bureaucratised the NHS, subdivided it into jealous and uncompetitive new quangos, trusts, directed to commissioners, directed outsourcing to private companies and appointed political allies often to head up these new quangos. For 10 years, ministers claimed health spending was rising and so it was in cash terms, in aggregate, but by the smallest margin since 1948. And at the same time, the critical measure of spending per head fell. So those deep cuts uh, in training left 100,000 vacancies for doctors and nurses just as the epidemic took hold. Covid brutally exposed the greater vulnerability of older people. An ageing population needed far higher spending and in its absence the beds weren't there and staff were missing and ventilators absent. Inexorable demographic facts were plain in 2010. The number of people aged over 65 rising by 25% across the decade. No planning was made for that fact. A cynic might observe that one grim fact useful to Tory ministers was that on their watch by 2018, the long run increase in longevity in the UK stopped and even went into reverse for poorer women. Social care in ageing Britain had been brutally exposed uh, for its inadequacy, revealed day after day, both in care homes, not just in care homes, but in the lack of services for the frail in their own homes. The last decade saw social care deliberately and rapidly withdrawn as successive Tory cabinets made councils their principal targets for cuts. Their maxim, right from the beginning, had been devolve the axe, let councils take the flag. So cash-strapped councils tightened eligibility for help, squeezed the fees paid to place all the disabled people in care homes. They closed their own institutions, relying almost entirely on private companies in the care sector. So when COVID struck, the whole apparatus tumbled. Care home staff paid poverty wages, working zero hours for multiple homes, both transmitted the infection and were themselves, we've seen, infected. Profit-seeking companies running their homes failed to buy protective equipment. I mean, Cameron, May and Johnson were all well aware of the care problem, but they simply retreated from it as just too hard to handle. Uh, Cameron commissioned a study on the financing, but then he shelved it. May broached paying for better care, but the moment it uh, was off the post by her own side in the middle of that 2017 election campaign, she too ran away and dropped it the very next day. All solutions in the care question surely involve contributing, all of us contributing more in personal payments or through taxes. But the last decade, we say, was characterised by ideological aversion to fairer taxation, especially of wealth, and an equally dogmatic commitment to reducing state involvement in economy and society. And this embraced even the mild programmes of local authorities. The old Conservative Party, the Conservative Party Tories, controlled many of England's councils. In this starkly partisan decade, local leaders put party loyalty ahead of public interest and winced, but kept quiet when their budgets were screwed down. 
Austerity explains why the UK's COVID death toll has been quite so high. I think it's something that astonishes people around the country. Uh, its effects insidious and covert as well as direct. The 2016 pandemic planning exercise, a kind of rehearsal codenamed Operation Cygnus, listed preparations that were necessary, but at the time, penny-pinching ministers forbade spending on any emergency planning. Civil servants were distracted or had literally disappeared. In one of the decade's ironies, many civil servants were redeployed away to try to salvage what they could from Brexit. Britain needn't have joined the highest corona death league had all those civil servants been spending their hours planning, instead of spending their hours planning for a no-deal Brexit, had devoted them to preparing for a well-predicted SARS-like respiratory epidemic. This crisis has exposed very familiar fissures in British society. The divergent fates of those without gardens, for instance, without computers or internet access. Shocking to find so many children had no access. Those without food and no alternative but to travel by bus and those from BME backgrounds. Uh, the great divides in society really were uh, impossible to hide during this crisis. In the last few months we've seen households used to a decent income suddenly having the shock revelation of applying for universal credit and discovering what Ian Duncan Smith and other ministers have been up to. Benefits for those of working age have been slashed. The welfare state safety net was full of holes. Protections were minimal. Getting help with rent and how to pay for the basics of life had become humiliating, humiliating and impoverishing. Some things were reassuring. One was that the crisis revealed how much of the old NHS ethos still remained, not just within the institution itself, but the passionate feelings that the public held, uh, affection that the public held for it. Staff pulled together selflessly and courageously. And the crisis nurtured also a kind of neighbourliness and a newfound appreciation of public services. It turned out that reserves of selfless commitment uh, had depleted, but they really weren't exhausted. Once the uh, emergency sent money flowing, the constricting contract culture was abandoned and people believed in the collective public services perhaps more strongly than they had before. Recovery, it's clear, depends on an active and imaginative state, a willingness to plan cooperatively with employers, unions and citizens. Johnson proved pragmatic enough to irrigate the economy with emergency money, but gut instincts around his cabinet table and among the cabal of special advisers remains laissez-faire. Johnson and predecessors ran governments that didn't, at a fundamental level, believe in government. Instead, they mocked it as red tape bureaucracy and the nanny state. If the, panic, if the pandemic revealed uh, the depth of mutual commitment, it also showed how fragile charities and the voluntary organisations had become, despite, remember Cameron, talking about the big society and expecting charities to step up. In fact, uh, there had been especially orchestrated attacks on them by Cameron's government. Uh, not only the huge cuts to, char to charities and withdrawal of contracts uh, from them, the crisis put on display modern Britain's stark inequalities and the sheer privilege enjoyed by the wealthy, immune as far as they could push it from the rules governing other people. In the last decade, we discussed the formula measuring income inequality, the Gini coefficient. Recent new estimates by the Resolution Foundation show there's been undercounting of the affluence of the wealthiest who can manipulate tax rules to move money when it suits between dividends and salaries, capital and income. The epidemic itself has exposed how the poorest and ethnic minorities have died in greatest numbers, following the familiar gradient where years of healthy life match social standing. The UK, the most unequal among similar countries, could probably not have avoided a higher tally of Covid deaths than other countries because of that underlying inequality. But out of the darkness of the pandemic emerge glimpses of what could be a better Britain. Everyone around us now can see we could be greener. Our public workers could and should be better rewarded, particularly as those the lowest paid are the ones who've paid the highest price. They should and could have fairer shares. Power could be better spread between staff and employees. 
the UK could be less addicted to imports with an economy less biased towards services. A new sense of community can give rise to a more social democratic Britain. If that's the new mood, then these mean-spirited governments since 2010 will look even more wasteful, unnecessarily, and now anachronistic. The wrong road, we argue, was taken. We detoured up a cul-de-sac. And on that wasted journey, disastrous decisions were taken that will permanently scar the future of our country, notably the way the Brexit vote was held and its aftermath. But post-Covid, there's a chance to rethink. Both how society and the economy are organised, but first we have to grasp how and why we got here and how badly we did. We say if we don't understand the recent past, we risk repeating it, and that would be fatal. Just a brief word about, about this book. We had already written, as Lawrence mentioned, the story of Labour's years in power, which was published in 2010. It's called The Verdict. Um, uh, and it was about all that Labour had and hadn't achieved. It was a tally, it was a reckoning, an audit of, of what Labour had done. We wanted to, to preserve that record of how much had changed and some things that hadn't. And in that book, we talked to people all, all around the country, different walks of life, different occupations, different income levels, to ask them what they'd felt about the Labour years, how they'd gained or not. Um, so for writing this book 10 years later, we've been back to see many of the same people to try to form a picture of how this decade has been for them. And yes, a number of them did vote Brexit. The clouds and public discontent about migration that we'd explored in 2010 gathered and were exploited by Cummings and the Vote Leave campaign. There's no question a bullheaded get out sentiment underpinned that vote. We were reminded not for the first time of how big the gulf is between those who focus on politics and public affairs, like you, and so many of our fellow citizens who live their lives contemptuous of and often oblivious to policy and collective choice. But Brexit was undoubtedly caused in part by austerity, and that was one of the greatest con jobs of recent times. George Osborne emerges in our pages as one of the most astute and cynical and partisan of recent politicians. Cameron was rather lazy and complacent, chillaxed, but also deeply ideological. His instincts, like those of his Tory generation, largely Thatcherite. But the last decade book isn't about comings and goings at Westminster, but rather how people's lives were touched by the decimation of short start the withdrawal of schools from public accountability in England, the rundown of environmental health, the politicisation of charity supervision, and so on. Devolution accomplished under Tony Blair is also part of the story. Things were a bit different in Wales and Scotland, but less different than they might have been. It's the caution of the Scottish nationalists and the tepid nature of Labour's leadership in Wales that's striking. Our publishers uh, were rightly keen that we should end the book on an upbeat note. So here's what we have said in the book about the future. When people list their hopes and concerns for the future, for family or for society, the remedies they call for rely on collective action, local, national or international. Jobs and prosperity depend on markets, commerce and capitalism, but those only thrive under the conditions, regulations, infrastructure and encouragements of a good democratic state. After the survival of the planet on which we live, what matters most are the things we can only provide together jointly. Good health, education, a decent working life, safety. Ask what gives most pleasure. And the response after family and home tends to be beautiful public spaces, well-kept parks, stadiums, sports centres, museums, treasured heritage and public buildings to be proud of. If pessimism is often the easy default, optimism is inborn with that underlying belief in common progress, the expectation that things can and they must and they will get better. The lost decade took many of those things away, damaging the common realm during fractious and bitter years Austerity was heedless and it was needless. The destruction set alight by Brexit has yet to, to meet a fire break, but it will burn out. 
what emerges from those ashes need not be some new politics, but perhaps the recovery of an older, robust national confidence, call it social democracy, that trusts in common purposes with a fairer sharing of prospects and wealth, much of what was lost can be regained. That was pre-COVID. COVID stalked the fire and leaves us with this conundrum. Trusting common purpose is stronger now than ever. Awareness of unfairness and inequality sharper than ever. But we have a government led by Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings that's partisan and incompetent and actively promotes inequalities. How can that good Britain we described burst out of the carapace of conservatism? Lawrence. Great, thank you both very much indeed. Um, lots to um, get into there, and I've already got quite a build-up of, of, of questions, which is good. Um, we will be getting to those questions, so please, um, if, if, if that's prompted thoughts, um, do, do log that on the, the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of try and get things going, or in a sense, keep things going. Um, uh, and there is, a, there is a historian's question coming here as well, I'm afraid, at, at the end of this. Um, but let me, let me press you on, on the politics of this. Because uh, thinking of uh, some of the previous work you did, particularly on the Blair and Brown governments, I mean, couldn't a case be made that you're a little bit easy on Labour in this period? Um, aren't many of the initiatives, the, you know, the kind of hollowing out of the state, outsourcing, aren't they new Labour initiatives in essence? OK, sure, they're given a very different kind of um, uh, colouring by uh, Cameron, but... Uh, are you a little bit easy, bit easy on Labour? We were quite tough on those things in the book, uh, excessive use of PFIs, but they did get, you know, huge numbers of, of new schools and new hospitals built, and they shouldn't have been so afraid of raising taxes, they shouldn't have been so afraid of borrowing. They were always believing that they didn't really have the right to rule. Conservatives never doubt it. They never, they're never looking over their shoulder. Labour always feels at any moment it's going to be snatched away from them and it makes them ultra cautious. I think after the shock of 1992, Blair and Brown uh, always felt they dare not move any further away from some of the things they'd been bequeathed. But, you know, they did hugely expand the public realm. They did hugely improve the NHS. Uh, they got rid of waiting lists. I mean, there are now seven million people waiting for operations. Uh, they got rid of waiting lists, they in, expanded NHS by 7% a year, uh, hugely incre increased the numbers of doctors and nurses. Uh, so any sector you look at, I think Sure Start, 3,500 Sure Start centres, most of them effectively gone now, great tragedy. Um, I think that, you know, there are always going to be things we wish they'd done when they had the chance and they didn't do. I don't think we were really too soft on them and perhaps now looking back uh, the difference the contrast between the Blair years Blair Brown years and these uh, this decade could hardly be starker thanks I noticed you managed not to mention Corbyn there I'm gonna pick oh, sorry, up I didn't know you meant now I'm very happy right, to come right. back to that um, <laughs> Picking up on David's um, concluding comment about the sort of the now COVID paradox between the fact that we are, you know, in a sense, it's, you know, we're very conscious of the importance of the NHS and that more sharing ethos. And on the other hand, those sort of stark inequalities that it's, it's revealed, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, BME deaths, um, you know, the point you made about gardens. I mean, is that the end of this of this lost decade? Because one might, again, trying to be sort of devil's advocate here, I mean, it is the case that the government are spending in a way that committed Thatcherites wouldn't be spending. OK, sure, unprecedented uh, context, but um, there's no doubt, you know, Johnson as mayor of London was noted for fairly uh, lavish spending. So is is that the... Has, are things changing, becoming social democratic, but with Boris as leader? 
his tenure as mayor was also noted for the construction of the Garden Bridge, which uh, turned out to be not only a disaster, but a gift of large sums of public money to a series of private companies. So that's partly the answer to your question. Yes, uh, in the emergency, there has been this uh, generosity on the part of the Treasury. But if you look recently, what they've been doing in terms of contract letting in response to COVID, in the context of the NHS, NHS Digital, th th there's an instinct still to say our friends in the private sector will always do better and we want still to... Now, you could, if you are a generous person, say there's this heroic struggle going on within the bosoms of the Tory ministers that practical circumstance demands a more pragmatic and even small s, small d, social democratic response but their basic instincts look as if they're still pro-private sector, anti-state intervention. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's interesting, you're, you know, you're an observer of um, political circumstance and we're seeing this t tension play out in real time. But I mean, if you look at the people around Johnson, his special advisors, as well as Cummings, look at some of the ministers, what they've said, you know, I think our sense is that that instinct, Liz Trust, Britannia Unchanged, uh, small statism, that's still a very, very strong impetus, even though in the circumstance of COVID, they've had to uh, raise the sluice gates and let the money flow. Thanks. I'm going to I'm going to ask one more, which is the sort of historian's um, question. How do you, in writing about a decade, were you, did you have as a sort of frame of reference any other recent decades in modern British history? I mean, I will tell you, and you won't be surprised to hear this, historians are a little bit sceptical of decades. They're, you know, they're a little bit constructed. But then I started thinking, almost every other decade has a slightly sort of negative air to it, or ends on a negative uh, note. The noughties end with the global financial crash, the 1990s end with the kind of collapse of the, the major years, um, uh, the 80s with the poll tax, the 70s with the winter of discontent. Uh, you know, uh, did, uh, how, does, how does the lost decade compare to other decades? The, I've left the 60s out because that has a more positive uh, <laughs> reputation. But I mean, was that something you thought about in sort of in putting the book together? Well, that might just be uh, that all, po all politicians' careers end badly. Every prime minister falls, or virtually or all of them falls, or they get pushed out, or something happens to them. Um, so that there is always a, a, a sort of dying fall to the end of their era. But it doesn't necessarily define their era. I think that it would be unfair to define the Blair Brown years by the crash that happened that wasn't their fault. That uh, actually he dealt with very well, but they took they took the blame for it, as most countries around the world did take the blame for it. I think um, you've written about the 70s. I think the 70s have been much misremembered and misrepresented by the same people for the same reason. In 1979, they managed to stick on Labour the idea that the 70s had been a time of nothing but unburied bodies and piling up dustbins and, uh, and strikes. And actually, you know, as you know, the 70s was the time of the greatest equality in our history, partly because unions were strong. And since they got demolished, uh, inequality has soared. We look back, as I look back, I think, on the 70s with very different eyes than the Tory myth making about the 70s. You know, the fact that it may have had a bad year at the end doesn't define the whole era. You have to tell me what you think about that. Your book. <laughs> That's roughly what it argues, yes. Although, of course, one has to add to that that, that New Labour also constructed the 70s as kind of what was to be avoided, i.e. sort of heavy-handed trade unionism, which is a bit of a myth. Um, my favourite 70s stat is that I think, it, I think it's 98% of all days uh, lost uh, by uh, workers was through health and safety issues, not through strikes. So. But we're not here to talk I mean, about you're, my, you're, uh, you're obviously right. You know, chronology doesn't determine what actually happens uh, in people's lives. However, if you think back to 2008 and the response by the then Brown led government to international financial collapse and the agreement that the opposition party, then the Tories, gave to him, and how in the space between the actions he took in 2008 and the election in May 2010, Cameron and Osborne swung 
pivoted away from consensus and constructed a narrative about the need for austerity, the extravagance of labor. And they, I mean, you know, we say in the book, I mean, George Osborne is a political, has political genius. You know, he was able very uh, adeptly to see political opportunity. But what that meant was that the May 2010 election was a turning point because we did get the reassertion of a fairly dry version of Thatcherism by, even though it was a coalition government, by, by Tory ministers. Now, I mean, in, you know, in favour of your argument, however, you could say there's no question that 2016 and the referendum vote was a, was, has, is a turning point in our, uh, the history of the United Kingdom. Absolutely. And so, in a sense, everything leading up to it and the years since, um, you know, create their own you know, period, periods. And, you know, we, we struggled with Brexit because it is such a cataclysmic event on the one hand. And yet it sort of also does fit into a number of the strands which we were trying to describe on the other. I mean, you know, Polly had mentioned that, you know, we had come, come across the phenomenon of public discontent over migration in uh, the end of the, the noughties in 2010. Weren't quite clear where, we, where it was going. It's clearly a, um, a political phenomenon. But as it turned out, it was available to the right, to uh, the Brexiteers, and, and they, they utilised it. Yes, and of course Brexit will be back to uh, entertain us. A little <laughs> bit more. Um, thank you both. I'm going to turn over to the uh, questions that are now piling up. I'm up to about 23, so 24, in fact. So. Um, um, I'm going to, I, I hope that the audience will be able to see these. I'm going to read them out um, uh, in case they cannot. So the first question, which was quite early on in the talk, um, was can local government recover from its emasculation and take forward a new participative democracy that speaks to and engages local people. So this was the point you made early on in talking about um, the kind of, if you like, the outsourcing of austerity to local authorities. Well, yes, uh, I think it certainly can, and I think it must. I think it's it's the only really hope forwards from this point. When I talked about devolve the acts, that was an expression that I heard at a Tory party conference just before they took power in 2010. Uh, it was Francis Maud actually saying, our plan is we will devolve the acts, that uh, they would cut and cut local authorities who deliver most of the services that people notice and see in a daily on a daily basis uh, and put the blame on them. And I think the hit that they've taken, so 40% cut, has been appalling and has left them very uh, seriously paralysed, having to cut their social care right down to the bone, losing things like Sure Start, losing any creativity, any spark of difference much between them according to what political party they are, because there is no leeway any longer. They're just providing statutory services and virtually nothing beyond that. Um, but on the other hand, it is also a time of phenomenally good local government. I mean, it hasn't always been good in the past. Sometimes it's been quite weak. But we've got terrifically good leaders now of all of our main cities and lots of our towns all over the place. Um, people that Labour, I have to say, in the last decade have failed to make use of. And had Labour been in a different place politically, it should have drawn together all of those leaders to show the strength and quality that underpins the Labour Party all over the country. Uh, of its councillors and it, then its leaders. And I think that is the way forward. I mean, a lot of very good, actually, there are a lot of very good Tory leaders as well who are very angry now, should have made more noise, but nevertheless, there are quite a lot of them who are pretty outraged by what's been going on. And so when we think about things like reform of social care, how you bring social care and health together, which is what will have to be done, what we've seen has really been needed, it's going to have to be done on a local basis by good local leaders, or it won't happen at all. Every, t every mistake the government has made during this COVID crisis has been trying to run things from the centre and mostly to privatise them, outsource them and run them from the centre instead of relying on the strength of, of, of local leadership. Yeah, I mean, if you want, I'll briefly, uh, a bit about yeah. for one, once upon a time, I was the local government correspondent of the Times newspaper in the days when national newspapers felt they needed detailed coverage of local government. 
that era seems to have gone and I, I, I it's also some regret but people it, it, some recovery is in the hands of people I mean perhaps our questioner Ruth will pick this up but unless and until people turn out to vote unless and until people are willing to pay more interest in the activities of their local authorities uh, instead of treating councils as sort of also rans in the political uh, contest and vote purely on national grounds i think people have it within themselves to recuperate some of the possibilities of local political action i mean some of you uh, come from the york area york is a a, a place York has a coherent and I think pretty good local authority um, that that promise could be realized elsewhere but it would take local people becoming much more involved and active in their local representation than they they've chosen to be in recent times great thank you very much um, uh, the next one, next question, I'm sorry if I mangle anybody's uh, question, I'm going to post this one. Um, this is a question, it's a particularly pertinent question about um, uh, care homes. Um, and I, I admit I'd slightly forgotten about this. There was, of course, a big debate in the 2017 election about the commitment to care homes in the Conservative Manifesto, which was eventually uh, backtracked on. Um, is there a prospect that COVID and, it, and the, the prominence of care homes in in that is likely to resolve what as Daniel says here it has been quite a long-term problem they have to do something whether they resolve it I very much doubt because they are conservatives what actually needs to happen what we've really seen is that it needs to be a national care service locally delivered locally run but a care service where the people who work for it are on the same grades of the same training career prospects as people in the NHS. NHS has agenda for change, change, which is their career progression and how they're paid. I mean, at the moment, if you're a nurse in a in a nursing home, you are paid less than if you're an equally fully trained nurse in the NHS. So of course they have great trouble getting them. So I also think you can no longer have private nursing homes taking in state paid pension uh, patients residents you actually ha uh, have to combine it together so it's free at the point of use for whoever uses it i mean you can then dispute how do you pay for it i actually think that the old good property should still contribute andy burnham had a very good scheme in the 1910 in the 2010 election which didn't go down very well because he said older people with property should contribute when they retire should pay in a lump sum pool the risks uh theresa may tried something a bit similar to that as you mentioned in 2017 and it was shot down instantly and she gave up the next day because the Tory press attacked it as a dementia tax. Any kind of taking money away from those who've got money and property, very difficult. So there are a lot of really wicked issues involved in this. Uh, and it would take a brave government to solve it. And I'm afraid Boris Johnson is not that brave government. He'll do something or other. I doubt it'll be enough. I mean, we slightly differ on this one because I'm afraid I, I think you have to take a real like them, th th those at the centre, you have to take a real politique view of this. Unless and until the status and the future of care homes is a significant electoral issue, they won't feel motivated to do much about it. And Ben Page of Ipsos Mori tells us that so far, despite the deaths in the care homes uh, in England, um, there hasn't been much movement in terms of public sentiment. And so people like Dominic Cummings, who are utterly cynical about, the, about politics, will say, why should we worry? We're getting no political blowback of any significant size. Therefore, we can continue to kick the can down the road. We'll put in a bit of money during the COVID crisis. But in terms of a longer run solution, why should we? I think the deaths will have changed here. I think the fact that there have been so many deaths, it now looks like 22,000 deaths, mm -hmm. a lot of them needless in care homes, and many more care home staff dead uh, than equivalent numbers of medical staff in, in the NHS. And I think that'll stick. I think people understand now that this has been a terrible, neglected, hidden from sight world most families probably only come in contact with it for two or three years with an elderly relative for a short time and then they forget about it i think people might not forget this time 
great, thanks. Uh, well, not great, but you know, <laughs> thanks, thanks for answering it. Let's, um, let's uh, take, I'm gonna slightly go for more specific questions in the sense that I think the Ruth's ideological question has been asked. I might go for Rosemary's um, question here. How might the opposition political parties best go about recovering the next decade? Which in a sense, I think we could, you know, is there a prospect that rather as the Conservatives managed the narrative about the 1970s, I mean, are you optimistic about Labour and Starmer being able to manage the narrative here? I mean, there are some indications that the government is seen, as you said, as somewhat incompetent. Care homes would be one instance of that. The Cummings um, uh, visit to County Durham, etc. Yeah, I think I am. I think um, people get using the word forensic because Starmer is a public prosecutor, but uh, I think he has that uh, sense of going for the jugular on the things that really matter. And we'll see him doing it calmly and seriously on things of genuine importance that will resonate with people. Uh, and goodness knows there's been enough uh, to, to uh, pull apart in there. And it will, you know, the story will grow and grow of how badly we did and why we did so badly and why the government was so incompetent and inept. Uh, and the ideology behind their reasons for, you know, Boris Johnson had said right at the beginning, you know, I didn't want this kind of nanny state, uh, autarkic closing down. Uh, you know, he, all of his instincts were against state intervention. And that's really what led to us intervening too late. So I think there's every reason to think that a very strong front, Labour front bench of really serious, decent, dedicated people, interested in policy detail in a way that Boris Johnson and his people really don't do, uh, will be a pretty formidable opposition. Uh, who knows, four years is a hell of a long time. I'm not going to predict what will happen in the next election or between now and then or how Brexit plays out. But so far, I think he's played it very well. Let's not be Anglo-centric, though. I mean, when we use the phrase opposition parties, we really have to include the Scottish Nationalists, Labour in Wales and the odd alliance between Sinn Féin and the DUP which runs Northern Ireland and in the context of Brexit I think the, 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 the constitutional role of the devolved administrations, their capacity to block measures which Johnson might wish to impose from the centre exists. They're vulnerable and they're small but I think we do have to think politically of a United Kingdom within which there is now uh, genuine possibilities for divergence uh, in, in the geographical uh, fringes and uh, uh, that sort of will add to tensions in Westminster but also potentially lead to quasi solutions perhaps in other parts of the UK than England. Yeah, can I add Gracie's question in here um, since you have both so far not managed to mention the Liberal Democrats either. Oh, right. um, so, I mean where do they figure in this narrative? They seem to be absolutely nowhere. They had a catastrophic election campaign. They made a very bad call over Brexit that I think shocked a lot of Remainers as well. The idea that we'll just do it. I think pretending they were going to, that they were going to win the election, uh, and whatever she's called, I've almost forgotten her name, was going to be Prime Minister, was so bizarre that uh, they came to a crashing fall. I mean, it is always a problem for Labour that the Liberal Democrats are there as you know, t draining quite a few votes away from them, but they do tend to drain an equal number of votes from the other side as well. And maybe in this appalling electoral system of ours, you do need something other than just two. You need two and a bit, two and two, uh, parties as well. But really, um, I hope that their one and only contribution would be, if they're ever needed again in a coalition, to refuse ever to do it without getting proportional representation, without getting electoral reform, that we'll never again confront people with the appalling choice of choosing between Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson, which must have been a historic bad choice for voters. I would have thought, and uh, you know, 
There should be room for new parties to break through, for people to break away from old parties, for reconfigurations, for a, a rainbow, if you like, of opinions to be able to ex be expressed in the ballot box. If you're Labour, you have to hold your nose whether you're voting for, uh, whether you're a Corbynite voting for Blair or whether you're a Blairite voting for Corbyn. It's not the right way to conduct politics, it seems it's to be. It's extraordinary, isn't it, how much uh, collective consciousness has lost the fact that there were Liberal Democrat ministers until 2015. And it's only nine years ago that we actually had a referendum on proportional representation in the Westminster. Mm, sort of. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously the great failure of Nick Clegg as leader of the Liberal Democrats, he didn't create circumstances within which he could have won that. He allowed Cameron to run all over him. And I mean, that's, I think, the greatest sort of, apart from endorsing austerity, which they didn't have to do, but, but did. Um, so the, the, the question obviously is germane. And in the book, we do discuss the uh, iniquities <laughs> of Liberal Democrat participation in the 2010-2015 government. Great. Thank you very much. Um, there are lots of people asking you to kind of speculate on whether Cummings is going to leave, how long Boris can, ask, can last as Prime Minister. I mean, I, I mean you're welcome to do so if you, if you, if you want. Then I'll ask you, I, I'm going to go to Andy's question after, ask, after that. But, um, I'm, I'm not going to put those questions up. I mean, what in the immediate term, what, what do you see as the prospects uh, here? I think it's been interesting to see Boris Johnson incredibly weak. Uh, you know, triumphant election campaign a very short time ago, winning eight, a majority of 80 that uh, seemed unthinkable. Uh, and you look at him now, and he's a pretty pathetic sight. His popularity has plummeted, nevertheless. He's still, well, he's, he's fallen just below Keir Starmer. Tory party still ahead of Labour, but has fallen very sharply. I think uh, the Tory party is really ruthless. If he doesn't pull his socks up within the next couple of years, I think he'll be at real risk of being thatcherated and thrown out uh, by his own party. But they've got four years to go and they'll put in somebody they think more presentable and whatever the issues of the day are in, in two years time, two, three years time, it might look like a Rishi Sunak, God help us, it might look like a Michael Gove or somebody new. Who knows? But they will certainly dish him if they think he's not their winner, because that's who they are. Labour should do that more often and hasn't. Should have done it to Gordon Brown when it was plain he was going to lose. Should have done it to, to Corbyn when it was plain he was going to lose. But they don't. They're loyal. Uh, but the Tories will. As for Cummings, I think he'll stay as long as, as uh, Boris is there, because Boris can't do without him. Thanks. Um, let's go to Andy's question, um, which of course in a sense is a sort of slightly Brexit uh, question, the distinction between the wise and the rest. Um, how has, do, I mean, can you see a way in which does that, well, I'm asking this from a university perspective because one of the points the book's, book makes is that, you know, there's still a very high proportion of people going to university, increasing numbers ex expected to go. Um, and yet, you know, in many ways, we're faced with the difficulties of, the, I think you describe it as sort of the, the paradox of Brexit, which is a sort of nostalgic conservatism um, and a sort of, you know, carefree attitude towards the future, which we can certainly see in this government. Any, any optimism in, in, in Optimistic answers to Andy's question. Well, you're a historian, and you know that one of the great, but largely unwritten, stories of British modern history is the role of the right-wing newspaper press. And um, you probably don't. Um, people so in this conversation may not spend much time reading the Daily Mail or the Daily Telegraph. Um, you know, Polly certainly does for professional uh, reasons. But I suppose one has a sense that they represent a block of sort of cultural power, of influence, and unless and until that dissolves, and it could, the Daily Telegraph's in very deep financial problems, you know, the Daily Mail is sort of uh, in the middle of a an unseen but real sort of ideological battle within its own ranks, etc. 
etc., etc. Murdoch, Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch will die. His children may take a different view about how his empire functions. So there is a possibility that that next that block of political cultural power might break open. At which point, possibly the divisions within Britain might appear to be less. But but let's face it: if on a given day you pick up the Daily Express, you still see a source of real emphasis on how divided we are rather than how united we are, whether it's the wise and the less wise or any other source of division. We have an, a press which is amplified in social media to some extent, which makes its existence the emphasis of division. I think uh, it's very easy for Remainers to think that somehow sense will prevail amongst the Brexiters, but there's actually no sign of regrets. Uh, people who voted Brexit mainly still think they were right. Uh, it's quite likely that uh, if we crash out with no deal, which will be a disaster, that that disaster will be well hidden under the far bigger uh, economic hit of the, uh, of the pandemic. And they will somehow get away with saying, oh, it wasn't all that bad, really, or it, blaming it all on the pandemic. So I think that cultural split remains very deep. And Remain must be, be careful not to fool themselves that it's gone away or going away anytime soon. But of course, I mean, you could add, you know, there's, there's reality out there. In reality, you have people saying, let's mobilise the Royal Navy to protect fishing boats in the English Channel against terrible French who will, after Brexit, try and still whatever the nature of the negotiation fish in our waters. But in reality also, the Royal Navy depends for its flow of radar intelligence on French planes and French satellites. And we have a very close defence relationship with the French. The idea that there would genuinely be the mobilisation of boats in the English Channel to defend the fishing, it, it doesn't stack up and it's just you know, it's like um, uh, your attitude towards the Chinese state and its participation in um, uh, communications and um, you know we will not have 5G if we don't have Huawei that's a matter of you know, practical commercial technological fact so at some points reality does have to obtrude and certainly with Brexit surely reality will will push back um, Whatever happens. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Mary's question. Um, I'm actually surprised this one hadn't cropped up earlier. And it's, it, I don't think, unless I'm mistaken, it's something the book directly talks about. But of course, it is an analogy that is regularly drawn the Second World War. Um, uh, I mean, it's regularly, it's been regularly drawn pretty much every year since the Second World War. But there has, of course, been a sort of a recent. Uh, energizing of it in, uh, in in responses to covid and of course in in boris's tendency to pretend to be uh, uh one of his predecessors as prime minister can you see i mean is is there something in the analogy uh i think nothing at all nothing i think okay. <laughs> i think the boris pastiche churchillian pastiche is comic and absurd and ridiculous uh, and, and, and increasingly become, becomes more so and I think we might see him trying it on a bit less because it does look ludicrous. Um, our obsession with the war, we forget, is so not shared across uh, the rest of Europe. People are so astonished. I find it astonishing that memorialising the war has grown in every decade. I mean, I was born just after the war uh, and it wasn't talked about all that much during childhood and things. It's just become this, all that's left of us almost, as if as our power seeps in the world, we have to shore ourselves up. We won the war uh, and all of that. Uh, it's pretty pathetic and it's seen as pretty pathetic abroad. And um, I think there are perfectly good, decent ways of, of, of remembering the war without making ourselves look absurd. It's not done, I know, to mention the work of other historians or indeed other books when one's uh, talking about one's own. But um, I just happened to have read recently David Reynolds' book, if I may, if I'm allowed to hold it up. 
I don't know if you know him and his work, but this is a very, very interesting account of the reality of the United Kingdom in the Second World War and how in the depths of the war, 1941, it was our dependence on flows of munitions and people from the empire, from the United States as it turned out, that kept us afloat. And so the, what, the story that you tell about the war has at least to be based upon historical reality. And that reality was one of dependence and cooperation. And if we're thinking about COVID, yes, let's have an analogy which says we will only get out of this if we are more interdependent, particularly with our near neighbours uh, in Europe, because clearly we're not going to have much of a relationship with the United States as long as Donald Trump's in the White House, at least. Yes, Mike, the computer that's behind the one I'm talking to is propped up on a David Reynolds book about, um, I think it's rich, rich relations, about the um, American troops uh, in, in Britain during the Second World War. But, uh, right. Um, now, I haven't got another one lined up. Um, uh, okay, how about this is a good one. Uh, this is Vanessa's question. Why are Labour policies seen as representing an extreme socialist position, as in the recent election, yet similar policies are seen as progressive in, say, Scandinavia. I, you know, I, I'm trying not to turn this into a sort of COVID discussion, but of course the, the, the quite variable response of the Scandinavian um, countries to COVID has been kind of interesting. And in fact, certainly Labour has quite a long history of looking to Scandinavian social democracy as a, as a, a, a sort of role model here. Um, do you, I guess we could open this into a bigger question which which flips the the wartime obsession on its head do you think there's much prospect prospect of britain learning from countries that have managed the current crisis uh, rather more successfully and of course that might entail a rather more interventionist um state it's difficult to know I mean, whether there's a sort of 1945 moment where people understand how much we depend on the state. I think there's a very good chance of that. I think people will demand more and better public services, won't accept a further bout of austerity. My guess is that the Treasury will try hard for it by the time we get to next year and that next year's budget. They will be trying to pull back hard. Uh, and I think there will be public resistance to that. I think people really have had enough of it. Uh, Boris Johnson may not like it because all he really wants in a rather Trump-like way is to be liked. And so he won't want to be the austerian. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out politically. But yes, I think a social democratic moment where we look to countries that, that do look after their people better than we do, countries that are less unequal, that don't leave people behind in quite such a drastic way. And the fact that you can actually count the deaths of the poor, I mean, it's Sir Michael Marmot is the person who's, who's really pioneered the work showing that in every category of disease, in every category of life, the poor die sooner, do worse. And what's more, it's a pretty straight graph that if you're in the middle, you're still going to dry, die sooner than those up at the top. And you can draw that graph with that wonderful book from uh, uh, Wilkinson and Pickett on the spirit level shows. These things I think have been made real during this crisis in actual countable bodies. They can't be denied. It's not a theory, it's a fact. And there are the coffins to prove it. I think that will push us towards a more Scandinavian direction. I mean, as for Sweden in this crisis, I think that was just a particular epidemiologist who had a particular idea. I don't think it was a political. It, you hear the people who think we shouldn't have locked down and think that we should get out quicker are the Spectator and the Telegraph and the Express. It's a right wing thing. I don't think it was in Sweden. It was just a and if one epidemiologist's idea that it might be better to get through it that way, alas, it turned out not to be so. There's also this willingness to look to other countries, particularly to our European neighbours, for lessons. This government, and I'm afraid this was also true of the Blair and Brown governments, has a terrible habit of saying, we're going to have a world-beating system, we're going to have a world-class targeting, whatever. 
the testing and tracing system, and it turns out to be rather second rate. That attitude that somehow the Brits are always best. I mean, we, we may be in certain things, but we can also learn from, for example, the Germans. How is it that the Germans have managed this crisis as well? Is it because of devolution? Is it because of the health spending? Is it because they're more generous in support of all people? There are lessons to be learned from. Less unequal. But this would require us to say to ourselves, yeah, Germany, the country we defeated in the war, has actually managed things a lot, lot better. By the way, Germany has a leader in Angela Merkel who cuts a very different kind of figure from Boris Johnson, but that's by the by. Yes, very different. I, I, uh, uh, pinged up um, Tim's question because it, it did refer both to the Marmot report and the spirit level book. Um, it is the case, in case anybody's interesting, that Michael Marmot and Richard Wilkinson, who's Kate Pickett's co-author of the spirit level, are speaking at the festival on the, on the 5th of uh, June. Um, I'm intrigued that nobody's asking, unless I haven't got to them yet, really questions about the kind of cultural situation. I don't know whether you wanted to pick up on that. I thought that was that was one of the sort of interesting bits of the book because you flag up some, you know, positive cultural developments. I'm, you know, I'm going to go for sort of headlines. You know, the the 2012 Olympics, um, the football team getting to the semi-finals of the World Cup. Um, you know, Leicester City as a kind of the embodiment of, um, uh, you know, a multicultural um, success. Do you think that, um, I mean, where, where do you see the cultural signals um, uh, after the lost decade? Because I, my reading of the book was that you saw quite a mixed picture, um, that part of this was the legacy, the cultural capital of, of uh, Blair and Brown, but that the, the Brexit was kind of closing doors as well. I mean, do, do, any, do, where do you see the cultural pointers? I think you're right that most of it, uh, you know, if you look at the Olympics, that was a bequest that came from the Labour Union. You know, Tessa Jowell and Tony Blair managed to swing winning the Olympics, which was extraordinary. So it was all sort of in progress. I think the golden age of the theatre and of music has been astonishing. But if you talk to anybody in those sectors, they say, yes, but look at the look at the age of the people who are these great directors, great actors. Uh, where is the seed corn? Where are the young people who dare or can afford to do drama school, art school? All of the things that they got that, you know, senior actors and artists got when they were young, whether it's a Hockney or whether it's an Ian McKellen, were free, uh, available, arms open, come and, you know, come and spend three years in art school or drama school. Um, all of that has, has gone and they're very worried indeed about whether there will be further generations because the cuts have been so severe, the price you pay so high for taking such a career risk. Um, and of course the cuts to the Arts Council, cut by about a third, were very savage. We lost a lot of small local uh, theatres and music venues that had been seed corn for the big ones. You know, talk to the National Theatre and the RSC, they say, we can't do that unless underneath us there is a wonderful rich infrastructure of smaller organisations. It takes time to see really how bad the effect will be and certainly the Covid catastrophe uh, will have made it much harder for them and we need a really positive investment in the arts to make sure that we replace what's gone. You are maybe sort of making another point too, Lawrence, which was that we haven't seen, we certainly didn't see during the lost decade, a British manifestation of what's called the cultural wars that have been visible, certainly uh, during Trump's tenure in the White House occasional little blips on the Tory backbenches, but in terms of the Tory leadership, including, paradoxically, you might think, Theresa May, there's been a strong rhetorical commitment to gay rights. Cameron proudly said, I legislated for gay marriage. Um, women's rights, even Theresa May, has gone on record saying we should be doing more to advance the position of women in break through the glass ceiling. So, again, you can critique the practical uh, demonstration of their rhetorical commitments, but the fact that they haven't felt that there was political opportunity in moving on abortion, uh, gay rights, etc, etc, they've maintained a broadly liberal sort of line. 
leaving the few extreme Brexiteers and so on uh, aside. And that's, that's interesting because I think it says that there maybe isn't in Britain that sort of cultural division. I mean, even today, in, even today in the House of Commons, um, Trump, uh, Trump, uh, Johnson, <laughs> Johnson felt the need to condemn uh, the death of George Floyd in the United States. Didn't go as far as condemn Trump, but that showed that here there is still a sort of cultural weight pulling people in what you might call a, a liberalish direction. But it's interesting, you see, because Thatcher herself was never very interested in moral, social issues. She was no, section twenty-eight. Yes, but that was kind of done. Not right. You know, it was not. It was not her core project. It wasn't what she identified with. It was a sort of lunatic idea of Kenneth Baker's and some backbenchers. It wasn't. It wasn't core Thatcherism. That sort of um, privatizing uh, libertarian streak uh, is all about letting people do what they would. It believes in animal spirits in all their senses. And uh, Boris Johnson is very much uh, an emblem of that kind of right wing. And it's always been different in this country, uh, thank goodness, in many ways than in the religious right in America. Great. Um, I think we've got about five minutes left um, before you can replenish your cups of tea <laughs> or possibly, you know, something else. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions. This is Isabel and um, Ben. Um, Isabel asking about um, how the last decade has, w whether it's permanently damaged relations between the four nations, and Ben asking whether uh, the, the, the likelihood of Scottish independence is, is, is imminent. You're the Scot, you can answer this one. Uh, yeah, I mean, the paradox of Scotland seems to be, we're talking about culture, a, a genuine cultural nationalism underpinning uh, the success in power so far of Scottish nationalism, but so far um, an unwillingness on the part of the majority of Scots to go the extra mile into full-scale independence, perhaps because they realise that the economic case for independence, particularly in the context of the Brexit complications post-Covid and so on, is very, very difficult. And, but that, that means that a tense issue in the life of the United Kingdom must continue to be, perhaps now forever, the odd position of Scotland, half in and half out. It's unlikely, it seems, that Wales will go in the same direction. But in the north of Ireland, surely you, you couldn't prescribe stability. There is, there is bound to be some further movements hopefully that won't involve any return to violence but the, the rapprochement that we saw between uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland will be picked up again will have to be picked up again post uh, post Brexit and so the United Kingdom as an entity cannot continue to exist in the way it has that that seems but what what form uh, whether there's a stability about the new form I think that's a, 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 a very different question I think that every sign is that the government has been extraordinarily slapdash and negligent about Scotland. Cameron didn't seem to really care about it. Uh, May bit uh, Johnson, I shouldn't think, has given it two thoughts. Uh, increasing numbers of Tory MPs say they don't mind if Scotland goes. Why should they worry? They're only a pain in Westminster because they tend to sort of vote in a Labourish kind of way. Um, what's in it for the Tories? And so I think there's a danger that they could let Scotland go and uh, most of Britain would really regret it in the long run. I hope Scotland doesn't go. Meanwhile, I mean, will they, you know, the, the Northern powerhouse as a phrase was invented by George Osborne, you know, would a Trump, um, a Trump, as I say it again, a Johnson, gov a Johnson government ever be likely to actually make that happen in terms of really empowering, financially speaking, the urban governments of Greater Manchester, South Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, Tyneside and so on, um, and give to places such as York sort of the capacity to be more genuinely autonomous. That would fly in the face of sort of many, many, many years of, of conservative um, thinking. So again, the tensions are there, but whether they'll play out in, in genuine institutional change, I don't know. Okay. 
final question and i'm going to ask you to be brief somebody asked you for three what do we, what do we this is the, the the last question i've got on here paul smith's uh question what do we do to put it right and you have to be you've got to pin it down to three three headlines sorry uh produce a better government, vote for a lesser government, bring in a better government with the genuine interests of restoring a sense of collective well-being, of uh, restoring the huge gap between the Brexit and Remain side. We probably won't rejoin, but we could at least have a, a much better understanding with Europe uh, in a way that reconciles both sides. Um, I think, you know, a genuine belief in the value of the collective again. And maybe out of this, that can happen. But that requires my last word, if I may, is, mm. is ang more anger. People need to be more angry about the absence of proper taxation of the corporate sector, the absence of proper taxation of wealth, the fact that people get away with not paying their due, both literally and metaf metaphorically. I think if there was a bit more fire in our bellies collectively, then... The, the prospects of change would be greater. Great. Um, thank you both very much indeed. Um, that was quite a gruelling set of questions. And my apologies to uh, the people who, uh, who, uh, whose questions I didn't uh, select. I'm very sorry about that. There were uh, 54 questions. So it would have been one minute per question if, we, if we'd asked them all. But thanks very much for um, uh, coming along. Um, the book is available, and if it, and if you want a um, signed copy, a signed bookplate copy, if you go to the Fox Lane Books website, you can order it uh, there. Fox Lane Books are the festival bookseller. Um, the recording of this event will be available on the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the Watch Again section of the festival website. Um, however, please allow a couple of days for it to appear. Uh, we very much hope that you will all be continue to continue to be engaged with the Festival of Ideas, in particular since it was mentioned the uh, Michael Marmot and uh, Wilkinson event on the 5th of um, June. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this event and other events um, and to continue the conversation using the hashtag York Ideas on Twitter. But above all else, thank you very much to um, David and Polly for um, a fascinating talk about the book and, and a robust uh, response to multiple questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>